Hi everybody, I'm in Bal Segev and today I'd like to talk about Prokofiev's Sinfonia Concertante. So grab your coffees and let's do this. In his book, The Great Composers, Harold Schoenberg, and this is, by the way, this is a book which I recommend highly. Uh, Harold Schoenberg describes the young Prokofiev, a student at the St. Petersburg Conservatory, as arrogant, with an irritating chuckle and a celebrated leer with contempt. As a man, he never adapted himself. He did not suffer fools gladly. He said exactly what he thought, and you can imagine he alienated himself from his teachers and superiors. He insisted that piano, for example, was a percussion instrument and to be played percussively. He broke away from the romantics that came before him. His piano teacher described him as very talented, but rather unpolished. A fellow composer compared Prokofiev's performance to a soccer match. Nothing but unrelenting energy and athletic joy of living. 1917 marked the Russian Revolution. As you know, Prokofiev was 26 years old and he went to the United States where he ruffled some feathers. He ultimately did not succeed in the US. He then moved to Paris where he collaborated with the impresario and founder of the Ballet Russe, Diaghilev. Prokofiev made and still makes a lot of people uncomfortable because of the dissonance and percussive nature of his music. When we look at this humongous piece, uh, sometimes we are just overwhelmed with how difficult it is, how long it is. Uh, there's, in my edition, 31 pages of just unrelenting difficulties. Um, every page can be studied over many, many hours. There's really very few of them that are just kind of play. I studied this piece when I was in my 20s and then I uh, left it for about 10 years and then I came back to it and performed it only in my 30s and it felt much easier at that point. Uh, I could kind of see the forest um, and not be so occupied with, with each tree in that forest. So let's talk about structure first so we sort of see the big picture. Before I start, uh, I would recommend you use Rostropovich's uh, fingerings. I actually studied this with Zara Nilsova's uh, fingerings and slurs, which are also excellent, but I think she focuses more on projection, uh, and uh, Rostropovich sacrifices projection for creating colors. And um, he uses longer slurs too. There's some small or not so small um, variations between those two. Uh, mainly I like that the font is bigger, it's clearer to read the music. The first theme is a militaristic. We have a D minor wedge theme starting rehearsal 8. A quasi cadenza at rehearsal nine um, that's over a G minor pedal chord. transitioning again towards rehearsal 11 where uh, theme and development come. Tempo of the start at the rehearsal 11. Um, then starting rehearsal 12, uh, Prokofiev is, is uh, moving from one key to another and there's a cycle of fifths here. So starting um, rehearsal 12, we have a Lydian uh, mode on C. So... Um, then uh, 13, we have uh, an F Aeolian mode. And uh, going to 14, rehearsal 14, which is a B Aeolian mode, Aeolian minor. And... Um, at 15, we have an E flat Ionian mode, uh, so E flat major, and again, a B major at rehearsal 16. So those rehearsal numbers actually are, are very helpful in kind of seeing that map of keys. 
um, Prokofiev is moving from one key to another. And if you will notice, uh, starting in rehearsal 12, C going down to F is a fifth, going down to B, another fifth down, going down to uh, E flat is another fifth. Rehearsal 18, we have the martial motif from the beginning. <laughs> are playing that martial motif uh, shortly after. Just like uh, the orchestra has in the beginning, we have the principal theme coming back at rehearsal 21. Um, I'm gonna call it a recapitulation. The Andante Primo um, is coming back in Rehearsal 24. And then uh, the movement ends with the Adagio. So this is sort of the big picture of the first movement. And uh, let's now look in more in details. What's very hard in the beginning is those huge shifts. And you have to have... Um, a clear idea in your mind of the pitches so that the hand will follow. So and here D to B is a sixth up and then C sharp to A sharp is again a sixth up. Uh, details that I was not aware of before I read a dissertation online. I thought it was interesting and it kind of makes you think. Um, anything that makes me think makes me happy. I like sustaining this F sharp. also have to think about how you shift in relation to your bow, something I talked about ad nauseum uh, in my other videos. Uh, so for me this shift will come on the old bow while you play the B. Uh, and uh, when you reach the C sharp you are uh, gonna change to the down bow. Uh, same thing here. And I would encourage you to try and listen to your way up. So it's not so much of a hit or miss or a game of kind of, um, let's see if we can be lucky this time, but you're really hearing your way up. Of course, you release the pressure with your uh, right hand um, so that the glissando is not really audible, but, but very little bit. Um, then we have uh, in uh, bar 17, and by the way, I added bar numbers, there's only rehearsal numbers in my part. Um, so here we have this uh, rhythmic pattern of uh, two eighths and one quarter, and then one quarter and two eighths. And this repeats twice. One. So there's a B pedal point in uh, uh, in a poco meno in bar forty five. As I said, rehearsal six is a sort of a wedge theme. We have a quasi cadenza. <laughs> I feel that uh, bar 63 uh, needs sort of a placement uh, because of what's happening in the violins. <laughs> Here we have an A dominant pedal. And um, here we reach the uh, D minor wedge.
bridge theme, which goes until uh, bar 77. Uh, and we're talking about uh, rehearsal eight. Uh, here there's two versions. In my part, I have... Uh, but I prefer playing a word Rostropovich plays. Uh, I think it just sounds better. <laughs> so a lot of times um, I will triangulate, I will listen to recordings if I know that Rostropovich uh, premiered this piece and I know that Prokofiev was there and they talked about it and so I know that um, it's probably okay to play what Rostropovich plays. Um, and so even though in my score um, this is what's written, um, and then of course you always want to check the orchestral score in a good edition at Busian Hawks. And um, let's see, rehearsal eight. And what do you know, this uh, is indeed what is printed in the score. So there's a discrepancy between the score and my part. And so I'm gonna go with the score. Um, interesting, they're both Boozy and Hawks. Um, sometimes discrepancies happen because the composer wrote two different parts, um, his editor changed something, he approved something but not the other. There's a lot of reasons for stuff like this. So you have to kind of educate yourself. Um, <laughs> So this is what's in the score. Yeah, another sh big shift. There's a lot of big shifts you sort of have to get uh, used to your hand moving um, those huge distances and um, hearing. I think the most important thing is having an imagination, having a clear idea of how that note is going to sound. And then there's just an octave. Uh, when I reach rehearsal nine, so this is an arrival point. Uh, you can hear the chord in the orchestra and you feel like time stops and here is a real cadence for us so if you look at the score you will see the strings are just uh, holding a long note so uh, you can be free i wouldn't be too free though third bar after rehearsal 10 we start transitioning to the third section of this movement so <laughs> Okay, so um, one of the difficult places. I practice them separately. shortcuts there. Yeah. You can fake a little bit. Um, I wouldn't fake when I practice, um, but if you can't play it as fast, um, just think of the last, the last uh, interval. That's what's important, and this is important. What's in the middle, not as important. So this was complete faking. I haven't practiced this piece in months or years, um, but um, I can fake, you know, and so sometimes we have to. Uh, I'm not saying that this, again, this is not the way you should practice, but if you're hitting a wall and just nothing works, don't obsess about it too much. Um, here, this is a E natural in bar 130, not an E sharp. And we are in E flat major. Two bars 
before rehearsal 17, we have the rhythmic motif that we saw in rehearsal 12. This one. So the orchestra, bum, 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 and then. And um, yeah, just throw your bow. Let it uh, vibrate. Don't choke your sound. In rehearsal 18, we have the martial motif we saw before. You can uh, drop, Rostropovich definitely drops at rehearsal 19, although um, there's no indication. But there is definitely a start of a buildup. <laughs> Let's look at rehearsal 20, and um, this is apparently a passage that Rostropovich wrote. As you know, he worked uh, closely with Prokofiev to uh, kind of spruce up or um, change the uh, cello concerto, which came before this piece and was not successful for uh, different reasons. Um, also, it was not very uh, idiomatically written. Um, so. This passage is, I feel very chillistic, but it is still very difficult. If you love etudes, I would highly suggest you practice Popper's etude number eight from his um, etudes opus 76. And here we have a very similar you know, passage. I've never practiced this etude, but I saw it uh, when I was reading about this piece and I thought it was very interesting, so... So this is from Popper and uh, back to Prokofiev. We have a recapitulation at rehearsal 21. Rehearsal 24, we have uh, the Andante Primo coming back. There's no indication in my score, so another good reason to look at the score here. I would vibrate on those 16th notes. At the end of this bar, again, there's a discrepancy between our part and the score. I would play that and not what's printed. attention that uh, you are playing with the oboe uh, one bar after 26. Um, and here we get to the adagio, the coda, it's bar 243. When I was a teenager I played the Debussy quartet with fellow students and I remember that our chamber music teacher told us that the person with the smallest uh, rhythmic unit is the king. They are the ones who set the tempo and we have to, the people with the melody or with the longer notes have to stick to them. Uh, so this is a great starting point for students. And uh, here at the end of the first movement, uh, there is a clear example of the opposite. So although we have the smaller uh, unit, <laughs> We do have to listen to the winds, um, which have longer note values, and go with them. So you should be prepared to play this in any tempo that happens to happen that evening and on stage. Uh, of course, you can ask the conductor in rehearsals for what you like, but um, there is some flexibility there, definitely. And uh, this is the end of the first movement. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.